journey. It's not a unique journey. It's not a clever journey. It's just our journey. It's a journey that starts in a place like this called Todmorden. And Todmorden is a market town in the north of England. It's not that very far from here. And it's just your normal market town. It's got unemployment and it's got a school that's got challenges and it's got health problems and it's surrounded by land that you can't grow a lot on. And sometimes you might think that that might be a disadvantage. But actually, the really interesting thing about Todmorden is it's a place that wants to change. And it's a place that's decided in the absence of any leadership in this world around the future and the environment and our kids and what's happening to them. Uh, in a world that we talk about nothing but the fiscal cliff, we don't talk about the social cliff, we don't talk about the environmental cliff. In a world where 20 years ago we all talked about the Rio Earth Summit and how we were all going to change and use less of the world's resources and do all that stuff and America and England and everybody else was going to come on board and do it and the leaders were united and 20 years on, bugger all's happened. And basically, so in the absence of any leadership like that, we just decided we'd make it up and do it ourselves, which is what we did. So a bunch of people looking not dissimilar to that, and a few more besides, and a fish, and that will become apparent what that's about in, uh, in a few minutes' time, turned Tobinum from what it was into this, which is a town full of propaganda gardens, where we've just taken over spaces in the middle of the town, and as I say, there's nothing unique or special about this, it's just about deciding it's time for actions, not words. So we're growing vegetables and fruit and herbs and God knows what all over the place. And I'm going to show you lots of pictures of what that's about. And it's not because we want to grow lots of vegetables and herbs. It's because we believe in making a statement that says this is our world. It's our gift to the future to do what we want to make our place better. And hopefully through the power of the language of food, we're going to help people believe in themselves. We're going to help people see space differently, see their neighbours differently. Invest in kindness and just maybe have something of real worth to pass on to our kids. And just maybe we can learn a few lessons and maybe we can direct those as some people have got some power. And maybe it's something exciting enough that other people want to be involved in. So this is our story. It's based around a really, really simple model. And I just want to go back six years because that's the length of time we've been doing this. As I say, it kind of sparked off because I was sick and fed up of the lack of any true leadership around the environment and the future and just calling it how it was, trusting the people to be part of the solution, not the problem. Stop patronising us all the time. So basically, I thought, OK, well, if we're going to try and find this, this common shared language and we're going to inspire people to believe in themselves, how might we actually move forward? How could I tell that story in a way that would engage people wherever they lived, on the estate, you know, down the streets, not just the Telegraph and the Guardian readers, but absolutely everybody. How could they create a movement where everybody saw it was part of their own lives and their self-interest to work with others to build this different kind of world? So, I thought, well, you know, when I was a kid, you used to have circuses going around and they used to spin plates. And it used to be action theatre. And what I wanted to do was tell a story that was about action theatre. You know, it wasn't about reading reports. It wasn't about writing strategies. It wasn't about anything like that. It was simply about saying to people, you have got the power to change on your own hands. Wake up. Stop being a victim. Stop waiting for the check. Stop asking for permission. Just go out there and build a better world. And that might sound trite, but what we've been doing in the last six years around this very simple concept of using food as a single point of focus for maximum elaboration has given me a lot of encouragement and made me think there is a different way of looking at the world. And just maybe we've got it wrong. The future will be different to the past and therefore how we engage with that future has to be different to how we engage with the past. So, I was at a conference in London. It just popped into my head that we ought to do something about it six years ago. So I got on a train, and in two hours, I just made the whole thing up. And I didn't write a strategy document. I didn't do a report. I certainly didn't consult anybody about it. I just went to my mate, Mary, and I sat on her kitchen table in the middle of Todd and said, right, Mary, are you up for this? We're going to do a forever project. It's going to kill us, but we're just going to do it. And she said, well, fair enough. <laughs> Nothing much on this weekend, so we might as well start. So we built a very simple model, which is about these three spinning plates that the community themselves create theatre with, start to themselves deciding how they want to impact around their town and with their neighbours. Community. That's the plate about how we live our everyday lives. You know, what we do in our front gardens and our back gardens, what we see on the high street when we go and shop, what we see when we go to the doctors, what we see around our schools, just the way we live our lives, the edible landscapes of our lives. Is it possible we could do those? 
And what about learning? Suppose we actually could influence what our children are being taught in the schools. So, so people who have got some wonderful skills but may not want to be a rocket scientist, how could we encourage them to, to, to get excited about the real interesting things around food and futures and all manner of creativity? And if you marry that with also working out in the community to, to share other skills, the ones we've lost, about pickling and bottling and how to skin a rabbit and how to graft a tree and whatever else it might be, and I made this up six years ago before we had all these blooming austerity measures, but it's coming quite handy in the interim. And then here's the third plate. If you're creating edible landscapes around your lives, it's a no-brainer. And if you're also interested in seasonal food and what's actually growing around you, you're more likely to spend the pound in your pocket on somebody who's also of a similar nature. A local farmer, a local producer, your local market, not your supermarket. We are not opposed to supermarkets. We're not opposed to anything. I'm bored with the placard mentality. This is about what we can do that's a positive thing, not what's negative. Let's make our supermarkets and our local producers and processors proud and strong and economically viable because we choose to support them. You know, and if we then have to change our buying habits in order to do that, then damn well, let's undo it. Because by spinning these three plates together, the proposition is we can build strong, kinder, more resilient communities. Let's just see what's happened. So, this is my mate Mary's house. And I always show this because this was the first propaganda garden we did. Well, no, actually, that's a lie. The very first propaganda garden we did was a dog toilet on the main road. So what we actually did was get into the dog toilet, clean it all up, plant it with herbs and trees, and put a big sign that said, this is an incredible garden, help yourself. And slowly, 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 people started to do that. Although, of course, people don't do that for at least two years because they're so concerned they're going to be shot or sued or whatever else it might be. But eventually, they do start to pick and taste and put it in their kids' lunchbox or whatever it is. And here's the interesting thing about the dog toilet. For centuries, it seems to me, the local authority completely ignored it, hence the cans and the beer and the poo and whatever else it might be. Blow me, within six months of doing a wonderful herb garden, they started mowing the grass and they put a bench there. I mean, how incredible is that? So you can change people's behaviour wherever they are. And I am not anti-local government. I used to lead one. I'm very pro it. But it needs to wake up to a different future. So here we're back to Mary's garden. So that was a perfectly normal garden at one time. It had roses and petunias and whatever else these gardens have. But Mary decided she was going to do something. So she took the front wall down and she planted it up with herbs and trees and whatever people could eat and share and enjoy. And what happened about six months later, when she'd done that, a local sign maker came along and said, can I help? Because this happens all the time. Once you start, people come out of the woodwork to help you make it happen. Can I put a sign up there that shows what you're actually... Can I take some pictures and incorporate it into this metal sign and then people will know what they're eating and when they can pick it? And this big sign that says food for free, and she said, that's fantastic. But that wasn't the best thing about Mary's Garden. The best thing about Mary's Garden was it's at the bottom of a hill that leads up to one of our estates. And every day, a mum and her kids would walk past that to a school. And one day, two years on, they stop and they start to pick bits and bobs, you know, a bit of broccoli here, a bit of herb there, whatever it might be. And they go away. And then, an hour or so later, the kids come back, because that's what they're taught at school, and they take the outside of the cabbage and they put them in the bin, and that's great. But the really important thing was the next morning, on the doorstep, on Mary's doorstep, was a bowl of soup made from the vegetables picked from Mary's garden by complete strangers. And that is community. And that is just, if you're brave enough to share and to say, let's change the world, people just come and help you do it. And then there's the health centre. Well, we did ask the doctors because we thought they might notice if we start ripping up things all over the place. But here's the thing. Can you understand it? We built a £6 million health centre and we surround it with prickly plants that you can't eat. But we also run a multi-million pound campaign that says eat five a day. Let me see. Does that make sense? No. So we went to the doctors and we said, would you mind if we took up your prickly plants and planted edibles? And they said, yeah, that's absolutely fine, provided we don't have to do it and it doesn't cost us a penny. And there's a theme that runs through our entire life. They all say that. <laughs> <laughs> so we said, fine, that's all right. So we fundraised and we, we got some trees and there we planted apple trees and pear trees and raspberries and strawberries and herbs. And the people that go to that health centre can start to taste them. And they don't rip them up and they don't vandalise them. People don't vandalise food. They, my mate Mary says... Forgive me for saying this. You might piss on a petunia, but you don't on a parsnip. And that seems to be the way forward. <laughs> so fundamentally, the idea is creating an edible landscape around every health centre. Just take up the prickly plants and put in edibles to share. It makes a lot more sense. 
And of course, we've got the railway station. You get off the train, you can pick plants as, um, of herbs along the railway station. And then with some of the lads from probation, we, we did some demolition work with somebody. It was perfectly legal. They let us do it. And we got the wood and we built these uh, raised beds. And now people can get off a train and they can pick nasturtiums or rocket or whatever. And you know, if someone empties a bed, they need it. So you just replant it. You've not just destroyed the Eiffel Tower. Because this is a movement for everybody. We've got a really simple membership slogan. If you eat, you're in. <laughs> so basically, that means that practically everybody on this planet's got a role in this movement. <laughs> and then, of course, who could... I mean, we couldn't resist it, really. So we went to the police station and said, would you mind if we built a raised bed in front of the police station? And they said, as long as it doesn't cost us and we don't have to do it. <laughs> so we said, that's fine, sir. So we built that because we're very polite and we put sweet corn because it just amused us considerably and cabbages and whatever it was. Now, what is really interesting there is the police then watch on their CCTV all the people eating the plants and stuff like that and have a nice conversation. And then they whip out from behind the sweet corn and they have a conversation with the person on the street. And the great thing is that the police's own statistics are they've never had a better community relationship with the people in Tobedon than they've had since we built this. Because, you know, you've got to smile when you see a policeman watering some sweet corn, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is, because of all the propaganda gardens that we've got all over the town, and we've got zillions of them all over the place, environmental damage is down in the town. Their stats, not ours. We never set out to do that. We just set out on this idea that food will bring us together. It has to lead us to a kinder world, and it seems to be doing something of that order. And of course, because boys in blue are very competitive, because the police were doing it, the fire brigade did as well. But they actually bought their own tree. <laughs> and then lastly, just for the community, and there's lots of other examples outside the college beds and God knows what, the job centre said, could you come and help us make a better life for the people that are walking in and out of this centre? So we said, certainly, sir. So we went, and with some young apprentices we've got in the area, in the absolute blizzard, built this raised bed and planted it up with all manner of things, free of charge to the job centre. Now, here's the challenge to people who work in job centres. It's a two-way street. So when we're doing this, in the snow, doing whatever, and it hasn't cost you a penny, when we go to you and say, would you mind if we plug our electric drill into... You don't say to us, no, because it's not pad-tested, which is what these lot did. <laughs> So fundamentally, <laughs> there's a few challenges there for people in the public sector as well as ourselves. And then there's learning. OK, right, little ones. Again, as I say, it's not original. It's just joined up. Right up to slightly bigger ones learning about pollination. Moving up to growing raised beds with the schools, wherever it might be. There's lots of schools that haven't got the right sort of equipment to do this type of thing, so, but they might have a disused tennis court. So we built some raised beds in a disused tennis court, and now that's adopted by a local estate. And not every school's even got that, but some of them happen to be next to graveyards. <laughs> so we went to the people at the graveyard and we said, would you mind us planting it up with vegetables? And they said, as long as it doesn't cost us, then you're going to do it. So we said, they're fine. So now the kids actually grow there after school class. It's fantastic. And not only are they growing food for their school table, they are not frightened of being in a graveyard anymore. Simply by changing the edible spaces around your lives, you can alter the way people think about themselves and their community. And then with the slightly bigger people, we persuaded the local authority to support our local high school and help some of those kids that were going out with no qualification whatsoever actually come out with something really useful. And they're now doing a bee tagging agriculture. And if anybody knows Tomadon, we are not your leafy agrarian economy. So it's fantastic that these people are starting to come out with those qualifications and maybe be the growers and the farmers of the future. And these lot are balanced looking down at some fish because I told you fish would come into it because we have introduced an aquaponics centre at the high school where these kids can learn that cutting edge technology and maybe be the fish farmers of the future. But I'll come back to that in a minute. Then there's the other skills that we do. You know, the people in the community who might only have a microwave or haven't even got that, who might just need be, be interested in being the bakers of the future or the grafters of the future or whatever it might be. We all have skills that we can share and it costs absolutely nothing to do that. And we've put a thousand different people of Tobedon through a free course that shows them how sausages are made, how you graft a tree, how you skin a rabbit, how you catch a squirrel, whatever all related to food and some things that you can enjoy. And business. So what have we done with business? Because we are volunteers, there is nobody paid in this, and it's all an experiment. So what might we do? Well, one of the things we do is go and have a chat with some local farmers. Hey, farmer, we really want to support you. We think it's dead important that we have local economies and supply chains, and we don't want beans flown from African children and all that type of stuff. 
and they just folded their arms and they were bored to death. So I thought, okay, how can we actually convince farmers that we're serious about this? So I know, I thought, I'll create a campaign. So I created a campaign called Every Egg Matters, just because it amused me. And basically we had a, this, this guy's called Napoleon, by the way. Anyway, we did a stylized map of Tomadam, and on it we put the places that were selling eggs to each other from their farm gate, or their front garden, or whatever it might be. We started with four, we've now got 64. Now that's quite interesting, because what was happening is people then go into shops and start to ask for Tobin and eggs. So the farmers that have got a bit of a wherewithal start to say, I could up my flocks of free-winged birds. And when that went really well, they upped their flocks of meat birds. And then they started to think about pigs and so on and so forth. And the, it's only small shoots of economic opportunity. But 49% of local farmers in Tobberton and local businesses in Tobberton said their sales have risen because of what we're doing. Because we've stimulated the demand, we've opened people's eyes, and suddenly they're supporting the people in their own community in a way that they never thought of before. So we, give, we raise a bit of money and we do blackboards and we give these to our local market traders and they scroll up what they've got. It costs like 15 quid each and suddenly it's a great marketing tool. And then we've got, you know, brewers. We've got more brewers you can stake a stick at. We've got prize winning cheese people. We've got local food in every community. It's all about working out what your bit of this equation is. Where's your little piece of this jigsaw to put in? I cannot grow for toffee. Not interested in it, couldn't possibly do it. I can cook, I can do IT, I can do all manner of other things. I can stand on a stage and say to you, trust me, this does work. Just be brave enough to jump off and you can work miracles around food. And who's sharing the journey with us? Well, we've got lots of little flags all over England. We've got nearly 50 different communities that are doing incredible edible spinning the three plates. Predominantly in the north of England, maybe that's just because we're in the north of England, but always communities themselves, not local government, not your middle classes, ordinary people who are grabbing land back and saying, this is mine and I want this for my children. And every single time that one of those communities does that, it's a gift to the future. And that's why local authorities don't complain. And that's why the health sector doesn't complain. Because they can see that we're actually doing something positive that they've not been able to stir us into doing for an awful long time. And we've also got hundreds of communities all over the globe that are doing the same thing. But what will we do to join the dots? How could we actually show that you can bring community, learning and business together, just as a community, just as an experiment, just as volunteers? Well, we created an incredible farm. We call it a farm, it's not a farm. It's kind of a market garden training centre. It starts like this. You do it for long enough and suddenly you start chatting to the local uh, garden centre and they say, hmm, well, we've got a bit of muddy land out there by the side of the canal, would you like it? And we say, oh yes, thanks very much. And then we go and fundraise and we get some cold it's like fencing to put around it because there's lots of rabbits and stuff there. And suddenly with volunteers and people getting excited about it, it turns into this. And people give you cheap polytunnels or whatever it might be. And then it turns into this, which is where the high school can learn to get soil under the fingers when they're on the BTEC courses. And then it turns into this. So communities become involved with schools and that creates the possibility for jobs and apprentices. There's two people employed there now and two apprentices. And then we've got vegetable tourists. How fantastic is that? We've invented a new... <laughs> we have got people from all over the globe who come in the middle of winter to poke around in the base beds when there's nothing whatsoever in them. We have been filmed by every nationality there is. We are big in China. We're really shit hot in Korea. <laughs> and France... And France has gone totally and utterly ballistic. I mean, it is really quite interesting. It cuts across the age, the income and the culture like nothing else. So what can we do for our dear tourists? Well, we created an edible walking route, and it's really simple. It links all our sites, but it also walks people past our shops and our cafes and our markets. So instead of whipping to the supermarket and back, as they look at our propaganda gardens, they're having a little drink in a cafe, or they're trying buying some local veg, or whatever else it might be. We've taken over the local canal towpath. We never asked anybody's permission. What was really great about it, however, was when the chair of British Waterways came to see what we were doing. He said it was fantastic, and everybody should do the same thing. So if you've got a canal, get it planted up. And we've got waggle dance sculptures so the kids can understand how bees work and we've taken over the middle of town. This was a huge hoarding next to the market. And we persuaded people, we persuaded the local authority that it kind of looked like, the, you know, a dead hand. So they took down the hoarding around there and we created what we call Pollination Street. And we got this sign made, it looks like a proper sign. It's right next to the market. And people can actually see the types of veg and fruit that's growing, that's on sale in the market. And the interesting thing about that is, for years, the council did nothing whatsoever, and suddenly they've started to grass the area and put big picnic benches there. It's totally amazing. But anyway, whatever works. So here's the thing. It is a story of ordinary folk. I've heard a bit like Ambridge, don't I? But fundamentally, it's just ordinary folk. We've got a 68-year-old webmistress 
who was housebound, who not only now masterminds all our web stuff, she is our major tour guide. She gets out there, provided she's in by four o'clock, she's absolutely fine. We've got people, you know, we've got people who've, who never achieved anything. Young women who, who, who were too frightened to go out and actually do public speaking. Now they do public speaking all over the place. People have learned new skills. People are starting to be, believe in themselves again. And fundamentally, through the past six years, through this belief in the power of small actions, people are starting to start to believe in themselves again, to invest in their own capacity, despite what the sophisticates have told them all over the years, their own capacity to build a kinder and better world for their kids. And that's incredible edible. Thank you.